you for be give you us uh, your, your time. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. I would like to ask you if you can uh, tell us where and how you begin to work in, the, in this uh, in the movie scene. I, I read that you started with the Saturday Night Live. Is it true? Yeah. And then? Uh, well, I'm, um, okay, she want to go into the way back. Um, now, I went to school at New York University, yeah. so I lived in New York City. And uh, yeah, so I went to NYU and I um, began to live in the city after I graduated. And um, I started working at, at Saturday Night Live before I finished school. And a uh, spectacular job because um, yeah, I worked on all of the short films at the time that they made. Uh, and introduced me to um, kind of the best sort of rapid, rapid filmmaking around comedy writing, fast writing, I didn't write, but I was a, uh, you know, just a production assistant, so that was, and I got to uh, meet, you know, everybody, the cast, and, and all of those folks. Um, but you want to know where I, how, do, how did I get from there? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, around the same time as I was doing that, I also, I was living in Greenwich Village, mm -hmm. and uh, had um, a number of uh, friends that began to work in uh, advertising, and so, uh, but it was, um, you know, uh, stop motion animation and yeah. special effects advertising. And uh, so, um, in New York, there was a couple of companies, one was called Broadcast Arts, and uh, they were uh, the best uh, in the city that did that. They did the, back in those days, they did the Peter Gabriel, um, Big time, you know. Remember yeah, all of that? Remember those days? Uh, you know, back in those days, that was fantastic, crazy stuff. And Pee Wee's Playhouse, remember that? Yeah. So it was that whole scene. Yeah. So I was plugged into that scene. And then some friends, you know, some friends were very, very talented, and uh, they began to tell me about a new studio that was being built, not in New York City, but in Massachusetts. Okay. And um, it was being built by. Um, a person by the name of Douglas Trumbull, do you know who that is? Yeah. So Doug Trumbull, who was leaving LA, right, decided that he was finished, he was after brainstorming, he's like, I'm, I'm going to leave, you know, Hollywood forever, and uh, built this super studio, this very high-tech studio in Massachusetts, it was all state-of-the-art robotic camera systems, never before made, you know, all customized. Um, Cameras literally made all the cameras there. Uh, computer control systems that hadn't existed before. Um, you know, um, materials prototyping. You know, to make models and miniatures automatically. Right. So all sorts of innovations um, happening uh, at Douglas Trump's place. And so uh, some colleagues, uh, Drew, pulled me up there, and I got a job uh, in the camera department. So I started sweeping, yeah. and then within a year I was, you know, actually shooting scenes. I was like uh, running camera on on uh, scenes as well. So that was the beginning of getting pulled into right through through um, Douglas Trumbull, and his focus was not so much movies; it was immersive media, right? So he he was part of cinema. He did 2001 and Blade Runner and Close Encounters. But his um, where his mind was was um, future cinema, right? So high frame rate cinema, um, you know, uh, ride film vehicles, right? He began a lot of that new formats. So he invented several, uh, he, uh, you know, OmniMax um, uh, high frame rate, 48 fps sort of immersive projection screen, all this stuff, right? So. And he was obsessed with virtual reality, right? So Brainstorm was about that. So um, anyway, it was a major influence. So I was in this environment. Um, I would call him a mentor. I was in this environment where if a... Um, you learned the heaven being from him. Including that if something didn't exist or a method didn't exist, that you could actually, you could make it yourself. Yeah. Literally to the point where he made his own cameras. Right? It was just like that's what you did. 
His father, um, I believe if I got this right, his father was also famous. He was um, the head of uh, physical effects on the Wizard of Oz. Huh. Right, so the family kind of had this... Family of... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it had this sort of, um, yes, inside, you know, this mindset that they could invent, right, creative solutions. So that's the environment, and um, I got to hang out with all of those colleagues of his, and I never forgot that, and that really, um, I uh, took that with me into the next things that I did. So eventually, Doug, you know, he decided he was going to, he helped IMAX go public, and he sort of took a little side path, right? And he left us in this stu super studio that he made, but without him, we're like, what are we gonna do? Um, and a couple of the first movies that we did, we did wind up doing, one was called What Dreams May Come, which won an Academy Award, yeah. and the other was The Matrix, those are the two, yeah. two of the first movies we did. In the first, in, in um, there was a time where in like literally the same, you know, three month period, four month period, we had done the proof of concept test for the paint effects for what dreams may come and the bullet time effect. Right, same small team made both of those, and both of those films became Academy Award winners back to back, which was the very one disruptive. with Robin Williams. It was a fantastic, uh, yeah, fantastic look, fantastic uh, special effects. Well, it was incredible, and in, 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 not the parts. I mean, um, one of my colleagues during that time for both films was yes. this fellow Kim Library. He's now the CTO of Epic Games, and he's been, he was my colleague th through all the last couple of decades. Um, but he um, um, created the methodology for optical flow that was used to create the paint effects for what James Franco. And, um, it's, you know, just computer vision and optical flow were um, really uh, brought to fruition in cinema on those two pictures, on What Dreams May Come yeah. and, um, and The Matrix. Um, other techniques that were um, important during The Matrix trilogy is computer vision, immersive photography, um, um, uh, volumetric uh, capture, right? Universal yeah. capture, yeah. so the first markerless motion capture of, uh, of, of uh, people, so no markers, just like cameras. Arrays um, to uh, create, you know, like shape, you know, uh, shape of uh, uh, frame by frame models of, of performance and projection mapping back on. So today, a lot of these techniques are prolific, you know, in virtual reality, mixed reality. I feel that you know that you know these these all these things are connected. All the different people, a lot of different people who sort of cross paths in those times. We are still together, we're still kind of coming together on different things. Posso fare un'altra? Sì, sì, another one. Uh, after um, Matrix Trilogy, you work on a fantastic movie, Speed Racer. Uh, uh, did you like it? Yeah. yeah. A lot of critics. No, not the story, not much, yeah. but visually yeah. it was stunning. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about uh, that movie? What, what you made for that? Yeah, that. Okay. It's nice to be asked that, actually, because it was one of my favorite projects ever. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of different things that were interesting about that project. The first thing that uh, I would say was that we, um, the Wachowskis, us, um, we wanted to, you know, we knew that it was a born from Japan, right, the property, and um, we really uh, felt obligated to look very closely at the, at the medium of anime, um, how expressive it was, how they, it was much more important about the way things, uh, the way it made you feel, than whether, it, if it was real, right? It was more about like human, very expressive, artistic, um, in choreography of character, in, in editorial, in composition of cinematography, and we really wanted to try to capture that, and, but figure out how to do it photographically. And we were thinking about, well, their techniques, you know, these were like animation, you know, down shooters and sliding layers, and like really creative 
which were like, what, can, what kind of method could we use that would have that quality but still be photographic? So uh, a great deal of that movie, that movie has a, a very interesting combination of 3D, 2.5D, and 2D mixed together, right? So sliding, sliding 2D backgrounds that were 2D based on photography, and 3D uh, uh, like cars, you know, yeah. things right in the foreground. And we uh, created a whole system uh, of uh, making these scenes where, you know, we would go to a location, a lot of phenomenal, really amazing locations in Europe, actually, where we would uh, photograph roads and mountains and all this stuff, and we would, you know, attempt to create an anime-like aesthetic using these and components. You, <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I'm like an idea person, uh, but I must work with, like, really, really spectacular, uh, um, uh, you know, um, digital, you know, digital engineers and artists, uh, but you have to handpick them, you know, putting together that team is as important yeah. as picking the main designers of the movie, because in the beginning, uh, the whole process is trying to figure out the template, you know, the, the sort of the plan for how to do such a technique, so it's, a, it's definitely like a creative and technical process to figure that out, so you need a need a small team that's able to work that way and for Speed Racer that was one of the best uh, sort of it was a very it was a very high level yeah. visualization team like they were capable of doing all of the finished work to the very end but uh, brought them forward to into development and used them in a, in a creative way as well. Okay. That the Matrix changed the perception of the audience at the cinema. Because that was a, a very important movie uh, for the cinema history, I think. And maybe this called the perception of, of the of the people. Mm, because that kind of special effects uh, has introduced um, a very um, uh, how can I say uh, an important way of, of making movies in that uh, that kind of. Situation, I think. So, this has changed the perception of the audience, did you think? Now, the audience expects this kind of special effects from you? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that I don't really care much about visual effects. <laughs> and I don't really go to see visual effects movies, unless they're interesting. You know, they're interesting stories. Um, the reason why I think it Matrix resonated was a couple of reasons. One is it came out in '99, right, and it was right around the time that the mainstream, let's call every, any everyday people, were accepting the internet, right. Um, it took a while for people to the whole the whole '90s for people to sort of feel that they could participate and actually be able to um, to do it, right? You know, people have to get over fear of technology. And it, by the time the late 90s had come, uh, many people, like the tipping point had occurred and many people were now involved in the internet. And so I think it, it, the, the film, the idea of the film hit right at, the, right at a moment where people started to understand that there was this sort of digital world you know what I mean, starting to come together, the internet. Yeah. And um, and it, it perfectly timed it and sort of, you know, made that jump, that science fiction leap, if you will, where it was like, you're inside the internet now, right? The virtual reality will be like inside the internet, the internet will be a copy of the world. And so it was timed well, I think, right? In terms of people's curiosity. Right, about where things were going to go. That's the best way I would put it, and I don't think that happens often. And it might happen again, you know, in the immersive in VR, AR, right? We haven't had, there isn't, I mean, uh, ex except for like an extension of what we can do on the phones, yeah. there hasn't, and maybe it was po Pokemon might have been the first little tremor, you know, that the Pokemon experience. Yeah. 
but the mainstream hasn't really quite had the inflection point where they understand the next the next stage that we're going. But there's nothing like story to help people imagine, right? So some some movies really do resonate and they're timed well. A movie that actually I, I'll, I'll a more a movie within the last five years that actually had an impact. I feel not to the general public, but to the technology sector, was that movie by Spike Jones called Her. Oh, no, you remember that? Yeah. And um, he's he's pretty brilliant too, right? Like he um, figured out that uh, artificial intelligence was at some point going to be humanized, right? And yet. Um, Perhaps, like, like, for example, you know, Philip K. Dick and Stanley Kubrick also knew this, but this was really early. I don't think people had a comprehension of what AI even was. And then perhaps, you know, like HAL 2001, that was the first time that the mainstream had ever sort of thought, oh, okay, real consciousness and, um, and actual conflict with people. But, um, you know, but I thought that her was, um, her actually resonated in the tech sector because they were experimenting in a much, much more dumbed-down version of an interface with people, um, but they personalized it and they, so they had people understand that at some point people may actually, you know, start trying to have relationships with AIs. So I thought that, and the reason why I say, I point that film out is because I know when I, as I have been working with different firms, Silicon Valley firms, that it rippled inside their labs and they started thinking like, hmm, and w w that's a large leap, how would we ever get there? You know, they started thinking about that. Not that they are there yet, but they started thinking a lot about it. Anyway, so cinema can time things, you know, like storytellers can time things if the, if the storyteller is really intuitive and can, and can see. Um, I think The Matrix was uh, was one of those. Um, there's some other films, I think, since then that have been like that. As far as the, um, uh, the sort of visuals or the visual effects, I think that people, you know, the early bullet time effect, which was a little, was a bit like quick time VR, you know, but on a much higher level. Um, people uh, know intuitively what uh, physics, you know, they understand physics and yeah. what, you know, it's impossible to cheat time and space, you know, with cameras. And so there was enough about, it was, even though it was kind of a hack, I called it a hack back then, it was, um, because it was really actually just a chain, right, of cameras. But people knew that was not possible. They, they, uh, they didn't know why, but they knew it was not possible. Yeah. And so the reason why it also resonated is because only in a simulation or in virtual reality, could you cheat time and space like that? So now, for some of us who've been doing VR the last five years or whatever, it's like normal. Like we pop around, we you know we teleport, we do all this stuff, right? We're getting used to it. The general public still doesn't really get to do that, but but this is actually what it's going to be. And you know there are some examples starting to appear. I mean, I just I used to work over at Lucasfilm. You know, and we did a lot of very high resolution, high fidelity, you know, near real, near near reality looking tests. Not not necessarily like photographed people yeah. to precision. Um, you may have seen something that Magic Leap put out uh, recently, the the uh, Mika, the artificial intelligence to demonstrate the uh, uh, virtual human. Did you see that Mika? Yeah. yeah, that's maybe the best virtual human that I've seen, and it's actually real time. Um, at any rate, it's, this sort of stuff is coming, and I think that uh, Matrix had, a, the reason why Matrix was, had a, a number of effects that were, were resonated was because the creators, the directors, were open-minded yeah. and allowed us to use the techniques that we, so we came at them and said, do you care what techniques we use? Because we might try something a little harder or a little riskier, because risk is bad for movie making. Today, movie making is an anti-risk, but they were like, okay, we'll let you take higher risks, so try some techniques, and so what we did is, we tried techniques that we thought might actually be the type of techniques that you would need to do for actual virtual reality, you know, you would need
need to basically capture the world both directions, looking inward and looking outward. You would have to capture the world in a way that allowed you to have this sort of God's eye, free, free view, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, and because they allowed us to take a chance, and because we got lucky and we pulled it off, I mean, hard work and luck, um, that particular, uh, that thing had never been seen before. So, and it's possible for people to, uh, to find these things, you know, to find these uh, not, you know, first of kind, types of things in movies, in VR, in AR, if they're allowed to innovate. So white people need uh, VR. What? They need white people. White people need, white why do they need VR? For you. Well, I think people will need, I think people will want and need mixed reality. Virtual reality is going to be, I'm not sure I would put it in need. I would put it in, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it's, it is, I mean, I think it can be transcendent and transformational for people, virtual reality, because it really does disconnect you, mm -hmm. um, and I do think it can change people, uh, but I'm not sure we need it. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a choice. But mixed reality, I would say, I would say, there's amazing, productive, good things. Every medium has good and bad. Every medium can have a very destructive side, a dangerous side, and a the opposite. Every since the beginning, radio. Hey, radio's great. Oh, War of the Worlds. We panicked everybody. They're running. They're crazy. <laughs> All right, television, it's going to be the great educator. No, it's like propaganda tool. Internet, world's knowledge, oh, it's full of hate and distortion. Right, we can't, every medium is, it's got that double edge. So, VR, VR can take you to spectacular, wondrous places um, that you could never go to. Uh, and, and mixed reality won't be any different. Um, terms of its its attributes for the good and bad. But I do think that mixed reality actually has a potential of being prolific, like mainstream um, adoption. It has um, the ability of allowing people to come together. VR is not easy in terms of getting people to come together because representing yourself is going to be very difficult. Um, it's very isolating. You, you, you're discounting the place that you are and the people that you're with often. And people just won't take that up very easily. It's just going to be a hard road. But it will be a, a, media, a spectacular, expressive, artistic medium. Probably like no other ever, right? There's no doubt about it. Mixed reality absolutely presents the opportunity for people to be together, to uh, collaborate and or you know, create and or work together and or educate, you know, um, you know, um, in, a, in, in, a, in an engaging way and a very powerful way because that application that we're all interacting with, you know, basically can have a back end as powerful as, you know, the cloud and um, so that it, the applications can have absolutely remarkable um, processing power you know, as people engage with them. Yeah. But the key is that it's that it's people, you know, together, right? Yeah. We're together, and we can also bring people to the room that we're in. We can project the things that we're doing into the room that they may happen to be. It's absolutely going to be the next. It, VR is not, but mixed reality is going to be the next medium beyond television, you know, uh, that will be, you know, everywhere. And we will see a kind of VR viewer inside cinema in the future. I worked. I've worked on that for years. I mean, that was one of my. That was one of my obsessions. Was that um, you can create? It's not too hard to. It's not too hard to understand at all. In so far as you know, we we make movies. Okay, movies are very. Um, you know, they're very technical. Driven. They're very. You know, there's a lot of technology involved in the making of scenes now. Visual effects, 
computer graphics, right? As, as real-time computer graphics become capable of producing the type of, you know, realistic scenes that slow, you know, slow render computer graphics, we will start making whole scenes that are basically going to be um, not uh, rendered uh, in like a, you know, like um, traditional software, but they'll be inside engines, you know, game engines. The word game engine has to be changed because they're just going to be real-time graphics engines. You know, they will be the place where we will have volumetric photography, photorealistic scenes, all the effects, blah, blah, blah. The whole scene will be in these engines. Now, they will output shots, you know, for cinema, but it means that if that is actually, um, if really what's the media that was used to make that scene uh, is, is done, has been done in that way, that means that, you know, yes, you could watch a movie, but you could come back and you could basically, you know, offer a person a chance to portal into uh, what they're seeing, and so now you can basically be inside. We've done tests like this for years over at Lucasfilm, actually, um, where you can be inside scenes and you can navigate around. Like uh, Carmen Arena in a pizza. Yeah, but imagine that you had a movie, right, in which things that, mo moments inside Carney Arena were like a scene inside of a, lar a larger Alejandro. And then like, you're like, okay, I saw the movie, but now I'm like, okay, I'm going back to this moment, it's, let's say it's that moment from Carney. And we're like, now inside, right? So now we're inside, and this is how, exactly right. So cinema can absolutely have portals. Out to in this uh, Yeah, we'll see how they do. Yes. Uh, but some, somewhat. Uh, but other people are working on it. But uh, immersive cinema, being able to go inside cinema. Uh, there's other, you know, once you have this, it's all about the, the, the nature of the media now. So if you've, made, if you've made the media now in engine, all sorts of outrageous stuff you can do with this, right? Not only can you go in through the cinema, you know, that's one thing. You can project the cinema holographically in a variety of ways you could have all of you know, so we did experiments like that. Um, it made like immersive caves, but now it's like the scene, you're in Star Wars, it's all holographic, you're inside, right? Um, you can use glasses, you don't need to do, use a cave, you can use glasses. Um, there's just, you know, it's essentially, I mean, people could come in through PCs, just like a VR chat, right? Just like a social media, you can come in through other directions, not standing in a room. It becomes like suddenly this omni media that can be accessed from all over. Um, so and, you know, uh, and then uh, you can you can put it in yeah, I mean, it's on and on. I could take that scene and I could put it in Star Wars land. Right, I'm walking around the galaxy's edge. Right, and here's this. Here are these scenes that are actually happening. You know, spaceships come out, land literally. Right, droids. Every troopers run and they're out there. You know, so if we and they could be literally the same assets from the film. So there's alignment. It's no longer like a copy remade. You know, someone did a not as good a job. The reason why that matters is because you know the amount of time to go into the origin content of thousands and thousands of people hours. You know, getting it perfect. The nature of a of a character. Um, any other kind of, you know, element, right? So much time goes into the cinema part, the artistry, everything, that you don't really want uh, a whole other group that missed the sort of origin creation part of it, the development. You don't really want a whole other group like, oh, okay, now we're going to hire a game company that didn't, wasn't part of the original sort of spirit that created this cinema parts. So you can you can combine those two things too. And that will make a really meaningful difference in the content in the in the other media, the, the VR and MR online stuff. Uh, well um, we talked about you asked some question about the storytelling. Um, VR story VR storytelling. Yeah VR cinema whatever uh, we've already seen some interesting uh, VR movies, short movies, animation movies, etc. But personally, I've not seen yet something that is enough compelling regarding 
So we're typing AR and typing R. So since you are inside Magic Leap, uh, be surprised, happy, be surprised then. And I would like to know what you are doing there to make something about uh, something compelling about story, telling stories in mixed reality. So what's the future of storytelling mixed reality, and what you're working now on making this future become true? Uh, I have a lot of I have some different opinions about VR storytelling and MR storytelling. Here's my theory. Want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. Because I, uh, you know, when I was at X Lab, I was developing a project based on the life of Darth Vader, mm -hmm. and I, and this was going to be and they're going to put out something next year. I don't know if it's the same as what, what I started with, but. Um, Let me put it to you this way, you know, when you write a book, yeah. or you make a movie, and you're, let's say you're a writer, so you've created this fict fictitious story and world, right? Yeah. but the writer is a person, they're like a human being living in this world, yeah. right, and they are having a life, right, and things are happening in their life, right, maybe, you know, Writers often think about like, oh, my childhood, my family, my relationships, things that have happened to me, things that I pay attention to. And then what they do is they they use that as um, sometimes source, but they create metaphors in a sort of fictitious and fantasy sort of way. They like take reality and then they make stories but the nature of what's happening in the stories are often derivative of things that have it's influenced them or inspired them in real life. That's the way it works, right? And um, my theory is that VR is not necessarily the storytelling medium. VR is the experience medium upon which someone may take what hap things that happen to them, right? And eventually will process that and, and it will affect the nature of the storytelling, perhaps in other mediums. I think that, uh, sure, we can create, um, you know, two things. One, we can create world logic, like, okay, in VR or in MR, we've created this sort of fantasy, you know, sort of skin, you know, sort of the logic of any universe. It's like, this is the way it works, and these are the, these are the creatures that are there, and this is how, you know what I mean, the nature of, you know, all the nature of the world is sort of, something you think through world logic, right? But um, it's your experience inside that. So that you can have world logic, and you can also create situations like, oh, you're going to come into this virtual place, or, you know, you come into the room and these, you know, these things are here, right? And maybe uh, because you entered that, like, the world or something in the world will become aware of you and you're drawn into that. Right, so if you want, if you're talking about it direct to the person involved, you know, something that involves the person directly, um, I think it's more likely that what will happen is people will create situations for people, and then the experience that they have is in and of itself the story. <laughs> That's the story. Um, I can go and have a cool way to view an animated movie, you know, like uh, what's um. Like, um, who's that group? Uh, there's a couple of, um, trying to remember the, uh, uh, some of the Oculus story stuff and the guy, people who did, you know, they try these animated, yeah. you know, and they're beautiful and they're lovely and stuff, but they're, it's still, like, confusing to know where to look and choreography yeah. or where you're looking. It's like, I think it's belabored and I think it would be, it's more interesting that the story is what your experience was. If you could go and look, look back what happened to you as you were taken through situations, that's more interesting. Especially if you're with other people. Because now it's like, what happened to you? And how did yeah, you yeah, people? Yeah. So, and I think it's going to be true with mixed reality too. That basically the, the byproduct of your experience with others in situations, simulations that have been set up for you to walk into, right? That in and of itself is much more interesting. That is a story. And also, what you might take out of that, if you're a writer or a creator, right, you may have these experiences inside these simulations. That might affect the way that you tell a story, you know, later on. But that's as far as I'm, I've gotten at this point, you know. 
because I don't think I think it's a it's a really um, I think people are going around in circles trying to shackle VR and MR with cinema grammar because it doesn't really translate once you've lost composition and editor editorial think about it those are so we to we absolutely can appreciate cinematography and editing right as languages unto themselves you know natural languages so you don't even have to teach a child like you can put an edited scene which is totally different than reality it's like you know blocks of you know blocks of ideas you know in, in different you know shifting and you can stick it in front of a child and a child can intuitively understand what is being communicated what's happening here mm -hmm. no it's like one of the most powerful languages you know that exists editing and composition those two things it's not regarded as a language but it really is so you take that language out of VR and you're you're in this whole new place Right? And it's just going to be a long time, I think, before people can... Yes, I'm aware of all the different techniques of gauge choreography and, like, lead you to do this and bring it, okay, and all, you know, and that's a way to do it. But it's more about the experience, your experience, and the, the product of that. And um, what you are doing uh, now at Major to create okay, these stories, these experiences for, for people, so... The experiments that you're making, I know that most of things will be secrets and such, but talking about uh, more general, more general way, what you're doing. So I'm not really, I'm not really super focused on story right now. Okay. I've, I'm, I'm focused on form. I'm interested in form. I like the form of the media, you know, and I, I like to work with great storytellers and designers. But I'm kind of interested in the form. Like, hey, here's a new way to express yourself. Um, and so the uh, the form of the coming mixed reality platform is still very it's moving. It's evolving very fast. Um, things that I care about is that uh, not I, I really uh, don't believe we're going to be in a world where we have to be in a room all the time, stuck in rooms. We are everything. You're stuck in a room. You're you have to be close to your PCs. Mixed reality, all this stuff often stuck in a room. Pokemon Go was interesting because you could run around in the world. That was a very good first experiment, as simple as it was. I think that uh, what I've been uh, interested in in my last year at Magic Leap is uh, how do we uh, move to like city scale, like really large scale experiences. You know, what would be needed? from a tech infrastructure, not by one company, not just by Magic Leap, by a lot of companies that have different parts of a solution that will eventually lead to the ability to register. When I say register, I mean like, uh, I'm on a street corner in, uh, in uh, Turin, and on this street corner, um, actually that there are three, four, five, a thousand um, experiences, applications, Right, that have been put here by different kinds of groups. Some could be like the public. Some could be the city of Turin. Some could be like, hey, uh, 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 you know, a, a game universe actually has a layer that runs through this. Right. So every possible, not just entertainment, but every possible uh, sector you can think of. Right. Transportation, health, um, government and civics, arts and science, education. Right? Every sector that you can imagine could create a spatial application, right? And it could be uh, local to one spot. It could, it could spread across the totality of a very large destination. Eventually, it will be the whole world. And the question is, you know, how are we going to uh, align, uh, register, you know, um, verify, you know what I mean, uh, that... Um, these are applications we trust and want to be part of, or that will respect our privacy, for example, right? There's all sorts of things that go, spatial, basically like the internet moves to the world, yeah. right? It goes over the world, and that's a big deal, and it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of people kind of trying to work together to figure out 
um, what is the system of systems, right? And uh, so that's what I'm interested in. Uh, the the YF 3.0. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm interested in. It's cool. the form of the platform. Now, I, I get the chance to meet a lot of inspired people, storytellers, you know, because they know that this is potentially a new medium for expression. But they aren't, again, just straight up thinking only story. They're thinking it's really about, it's really about how you're going to have expressions of the world, including characters, you know, and behaviors of characters, right, uh, persist in space, you know, and what, you know, yes, we can curate things that are like contained and you do it for X amount of minutes and then you're done, but that really isn't going to last very long, right? It's going to be... Um, so that's not going to last very long. V v VR only got interesting when people figured out stuff you could do that could happen as long as the time, amount of time. Social VR is one of the only few things, right? Uh, in social gaming in VR, like anything that's live and sort of, you know, you can just do uh, because people are there with you and it's really about the, what you're doing with people, that is the only stuff, right? Uh, so it becomes problematic to think about, you know, it costs a lot of money to do this kind of work, computer graphics. It becomes problematic if you're just making something like a baked experience, like, you know, a full media. So storytelling becomes difficult if it's not live. So this is the magic for us. Uh, yeah. And tomorrow we will talk about it, just to explain all these layers. A little bit. I just, it's hard, it's like, you have to unpack it slowly, I think. How and I, a lot of people are going to answer the question. To see, the reason why it's, there's a question is because I don't have the answer. Okay, well, you can estimate though, how much time do we need to get that? To make the, the, to make, yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Five to ten, seriously. Okay. I think that it's, you know, let's put it this way, I mean, doing alpha tests of, of certain larger scale deployments. I mean, think about 5G coming on. 5G is going to be necessary, right, for us to sort of, you know, for immersive broadcasting high fidelity graphics. You get it? You're talking about, like, that's like sort of starting now, but realistically it's two to five year, right, where we're going to get into some serious 5G tests. And that will be the beginning of a lot of stuff. And it takes time to figure out what's interesting, what works, how people use it, what location. It's going to start in cities first, right? Progressive cities that want to bring it on. So I think five to ten, you know, starting in two. So we have to get, we actually can start getting prepared and thinking about it. But um, five to ten, really, as it like, works itself towards mainstream particularly in urban centers around the world. Urban centers will connect themselves to one another. That's how it will start.